Alexander Etkind joined the Department of International Relations at Central European University in 2022. He previously taught at the European University in Florence and at several other institutions. His research looks at the extreme challenges of global decarbonization and security in Eastern Europe. Much of his past writing is concerned with the question of memory of European intellectual history and of empires and decolonization. He's the author of many books, including Eros of the Impossible, The History of Psychoanalysis in Russia, Internal Colonization, Russia's Imperial Experience, Warped Mourning, Stories of the Undead in the Land of the Unburied, Nature's Evil, A Cultural History of Natural Resources, and a really interesting new book called Russia Against Modernity, which comes out in April. Here we talk about the war in Ukraine, but in the kind of long durée of various societies' relationships to the natural resources they use and abuse for the purpose of development. Etkin says that the patterns that we see play out in terms of what's sometimes called the oil curse are not totally new. This is a big part of the argument of nature's evil. He sees the resource curse unfold at different points in human history with other sources of energy like wood and peat. There are ways that oil is unique though. The paradigmatic relationship for Etkind is between resource rich and resource dependent states when it comes to oil. And he sees that division in terms of degrees of democracy. In the resource dependent state of Russia, the current regime sees the need to maintain a monopoly on information in order to perpetuate its unequal command of the revenue from the carbon intensive resources it's founded upon. Etkin writes about the dilemma of confronting autocratic petro-states on the problem of climate change and confronts the seemingly unsolvable problem of how the state, which he says is actually the only entity that quote, stands between the energy barons and the tragedy of drowned cities, can be made to radically disentangle itself from fossil fuels. But he's clear that it will need to be forced. He senses that in Russia, the monopoly on information is weakening that within the country there is an intergenerational war taking place over the future of the Federation. Given that a mass exodus of young people fled to what he says are not very hospitable environments, rather than accept the propaganda and suppression that staying in the country would have meant. While for him, this is admittedly a modest grounds for hope, it is still a source. The persistent problem though is that reducing emissions and saving the atmosphere from the death dealing effects of CO2 will require a sustained period of peace. Once war breaks out, energy transition becomes inconceivable. Forms of feminist protest and organizing the environmental movement organize groups who refuse the trauma of war and the tragedy of drowned cities. These are sites of hope for Etkind, but the ongoing asymmetrical sacrifice is still at the moment stunning us into a kind of clarity. In uh, your forthcoming book, you actually start the book by talking about how peace is good for complexity while war, you say, brings clarity. It's like a really interesting kind of macro and microscopic kind of view of what uh, terror even, like despair can induce, which is a certain kind of um, sharpening of critical uh, insights. And so I, you know, I wanted to ask you about this in relationship to a previous book that you wrote called Internal Colonization, where you say in, you know, at a certain point early on in that book that you, you subscribe to multiple conflicting narratives about Imperial Russia at once, you know, um, and I wondered if this current context, if you're considering the annexation of Crimea as the beginning of this war, many years long, uh, war in Ukraine, whether you have sort of reached a level of clarity, even almost simplicity, around trying to reconcile these multiple conflicting narratives of Imperial Russia. Well, thanks for inviting me to this um podcast and also for this for a very thoughtful question imperial russia of the 18th or 19th century has very very little to do with the current russia the russian federation the russian federation is an heir whether legitimate or not heir but it is a descendant of the imperial russia that was also a very long and uh, difficult soviet period I, I agree with you that uh, the war started in uh, 2014, 
but the authoritarian regime in the Russian Federation, you know, predated that uh, year for decades. Yeah, um, and so you know, trying to figure out how to operate critically, like within this timeline of you know many centuries of imperialist uh, command and, and the complexity of that kind of massive empire, you know, representing the the you know, precedent, the preface for this contemporary kind of resurgence of a certain imperialism. You know, I wondered if I could ask you about how the the new book, Russia Against Modernity, thinks about making predictions, right? So like there's this moment where you say like there's a great risk basically in pundits making false predictions during a war, during an, uh, you know, an evolving conflict. And yet you see the proliferation of that everywhere. Um, and you kind of try and undermine actually some of the major uh, predictions and and causal explanations for the war. Um, But then you do like later on in the book, reach a point where, you know, there's this really pithy um, line where you say, I'm not calling for the collapse of the Russian Federation. I am predicting it. Um, So you're, you're in this book, very conscious of the fact that making false predictions is incredibly dangerous. um, And yet you, you sort of you know, boldly claim that there is a, a, a collapse on the horizon for Russia. Um, and I wondered, you know, if, if, if you could explain where, how you got to that sort of conclusion, where you say, like, it's not easy to admit that the Russo-Ukrainian war spelled the end of the country, but that is precisely what you predict. Why, why hasten that guess, I guess? Yeah, the Russian Federation is, you know, very complex uh, uh, country, a, a composite state, and it consists of uh, many dozens of uh, administrative regions, includes uh, hundreds of uh, ethnicities and all that. And uh, these regions are uh, very different, very unequal. Uh, mm-hmm. They are different culturally, religiously, but the, most importantly, I think, for our age is that they are extremely different economically. The regional inequality of the Russian Federation is the highest in the world. I can give you an example. So the uh, richest uh, administrative region of the Russian Federation, a member of the Federation, is richer than the poorest region by the factor of 300. Wow. The richest state of the United States is richer than the poorest by the factor of seven. So in Germany, this factor would be like three or four. So that's, a tri- and it's um, this tremendous, tremendous inequality is a clear consequence of the oil based Russian economy. So there are two districts in Western Siberia that export oil in, you know, tremendous amounts. And then equally huge amounts of money come back, but not to West Siberia, they come back to Moscow. Right. From uh, Europe, now, most, now increasingly, increasingly from Asia. Uh, so this money come, from, come to Moscow and then Moscow uh, distributes them. That much go back to West Siberia, that much go to North, Northern Caucasus, and that much remains in Moscow and would be, you know, financing the war efforts or corruption uh, of pensions and salaries of all kinds of uh, people who get the money from the state and the vast majority of Russians do. Um, hmm. So... Um, this huge, huge inequality uh, defines, I think, the future of Russia. It could continue to work like that. In it's very, very delicate, very fragile situation. It could continue in uh, in very favorable conditions. Um, and these favorable conditions, basically, I mean, we, we could discuss them in many, many words. But one word is the most important: peace. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, terminating this peace was a voluntary, deliberate decision of those who have power in Russia. And in fact, they made the, the idea of the united Russia their uh, by far the most important ideological slogan. Like the ruling party of the Russian Federation called itself United Russia. So there is mm-hmm. no, no 
more important political idea than this unit of Russia. Right. Um, also for very clear reason that, uh, in fact, Moscow fully depends on uh, very distant uh, regions, very distant members of the Russian Federation from West Siberia. So um, this fragile construction will not survive the um, uh, pressures of the war, both uh, military defeat and uh, economic deterioration, which we, both of them, we are seeing right now. Yeah. And, and this is like, I think, again, what your analysis really shrewdly like offers us, you know, it, it sidesteps the, um, you know, the, the sort of binary logic of United States versus Russia, like that's a part of your analysis, but really like so much of your analysis is about the internal politics of the Russian Federation, um, which is like, you know, incredibly eye opening for someone who's, you know, situated in Canada, receiving this real kind of collage of representations of what um, Soviet and post-Soviet Russia, uh, uh, you know, what the kind of almost like different ontologies of it are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like it's, it's really to me, um, especially uh, illuminating to get your analysis that shows like this war is really in many ways a reaction against um, a, tra a transition, energy transition, so social transition, and so on, um, that in the face, uh, is to kind of jump off what you were saying, in the face of this kind of fragile concentration of wealth that is built on dispossession, um, you have an attempt by Putin to uh, consolidate power through uh, um, what you call demodernization or even stop modernism, like an, an effort to, in fact, reverse modernity by doubling down and uh, doubling down on things like, you know, climate denialism, electoral interference, and in fact, war. Um, so, you know, I, I really appreciate that analysis. Um, and it speaks to your point that, you know, terminating peace was a deliberate decision. But in fact, you're, you're kind of articulating it a little bit differently than that in the, in the new book. Like, rather than a deliberate decision, one of the things you suggest is that um, the ruling group had preferences that defined its choices at every step, a taste rather than a plan. And I wondered if you could kind of just expand on what you mean by that, um, that it's sort of symptomatic in some ways of just a structural reliance on oil, that it, it wasn't so much a deliberate decision as an almost inevitable outcome of petro-modernity. Yeah, I sort of spent, you know, many pages trying to uh, explicate this um, mechanisms of this uh, su suicidal decision making. Why mm -hmm. uh, on earth those actors that used to behave quite rationally, but showed less and less rationality through the last years or decades, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to argue that uh, these people who made this decision, that's very tiny group, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have a, an elaborate plan. They made these decisions, you know, step by step, that's for sure. It was like a chain um, that should be analyzed uh, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of serial, consequential uh, decision making. And uh, the, since there is no democratic feedback, uh, they, are, uh, they are not elected officials. They are, this is a very tiny group that, you know, ch shares uh, lifestyle. They, 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 uh, in their decision making, they go from one set of preferences to another. So basically, to make it short, I say this is about their taste rather than about any plan. Taste mm -hmm. is pretty consistent. And uh, it... It was realized in every uh, consequent decision that they were making. Um, but I, I, I think that what is uh, probably more relevant for the political analysis, for the global view on the situation, is the, also the, the understanding of the emotions in the face of modernity, of our current modernity, which is entirely different from... Uh, the earlier versions of modernity, 19th century, whatever. Mm 
Right. Mid, middle 20th century, I call it paleo modernity. Uh, we have an entirely different kind of modernity, which is entirely connected to climate change, decarbonization, reduction of the consumption of fossil fuel, uh, uh, developing alternative forms of energy, and all this together would, would stop those flows of oil and money that feed the Russian Federation, that the Kremlin and the, those people in power are used to. So they really see the forthcoming uh, bankruptcy impoverishment. Uh, mm -hmm. And they uh, respond in this kind of not entirely rational way to, to, to their fears. That makes sense to me. And I want to definitely unpack that. Um, you know, this idea that uh, you have this really small group of people that um, sort of homogeneous in a way, and that that homogeneous group um, reaches a kind of crisis point where their kind of rational risk aversion is overwhelmed by a specific psychic response to threat. And of course, like we have to talk about Vladimir Putin in particular. Um, who, as you write, like came to power in 2000 with the promise of suppressing major, uh, a major rebellion, um, two bloody and wasteful Chechen wars, you say, undermine the project of democracy building in Russia. Um, but, you know, you conclude that section by saying, like, with every imperial endeavor, Putin consolidated his personal rule. Um, and, you know, the West looks at Putin now as this sort of... Um, you know, comp like complex, but fundamentally evil figure. And what you're saying is that it is, um, it's a complex evil. Um, you note that when Putin was young, his KGB superiors wrote in a, a reference that his only weakness was a reduced sense of danger. So it really comes down in some ways to the man's particular mode of, uh, belligerent authoritarian government. I mean, um, and yet at the same time, you're trying to complicate that uh, reading by saying that, you know, Putinism is also about Soviet heritage, a resurgence of eternal Russia, and at the same time, um, individuals, institutions uh, uh, that chose to launch a war as part of this kind of emotional response to a particular kind of panic. But what I what I wanted to kind of ask you, because like, it's sort of hard to imagine resistance to this like cult of mach machismo that defines Putin's regime. But what you've what you've talked about in in um, your essay "Genres and Genders of Protest in Russia's Petrostate" is the fact that actually there are like radical feminist protest groups, like Pussy Riot, for example, um, that are an underappreciated phenomenon. Um, you know that they that they you know, are arrested en masse in the way that they are precisely because they can shock the all men patriarchal violent power um, that still rules Russia. Um, you know, do you, is that in some sense, like you wrote, you wrote that essay from a position of a kind of like radical feminist hope. Is there any part of you that still preserves the, the possibility of that being a source of opposition to Putin's um, kind of cult of personality? Very much so. Yeah, yeah. You are citing from my old essay, uh, as we both said, the, the the current war has changed everything. Yeah. But the um, uh, feminist uh, politics, as well as the green politics uh, within Russia and uh, you know and globally, I think give uh, give some some hope. Maybe the only hope that uh, we have. In Russia, oh, actually, mm. anywhere. Um, this is not only about this highly, high, into highly intellectual, uh, aestheticized protest like the, the Pussy Riot. See, during the Chechen Wars, one of the most vocal and important, really, uh, protest groups were a, a well organized association of the soldiers' mothers. So there's the, the mothers of the dead soldiers, the wounded soldiers, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, vanished soldiers uh, who, because uh, in their mourning and grief and passion, they could or organize in a powerful protest group and uh, 
the authorities had to deal with them. Putin had to meet with them and things like that and, and heard very unpleasant truths from these simple women. Hmm. And uh, I'm pretty sure that even though we don't see it happening right now, but we will see it uh, with the time, this kind of um, consolidation organization takes time, uh, not really, not, not decades, but uh, probably more than a year. Frankly, I expected this to happen, you know, during the first months of the war, when uh, these mothers started to get the news about the killing or, or uh, disabling uh, their sons. But uh, it, it, it is coming. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not possible to suppress it completely. Um, this this is maybe your point, or, or it reinforces your point about the kind of fragility of the sort of um, you know the monopoly on information that Putin is is attempting to maintain. You have this competition of different forces at the current moment. Um, one being a military monopoly and an economic monopoly, and the other being uh, the question of uh, knowledge in a way, like what what ideas can prevail if it is the case, as you suggest, that uh, war brings a certain kind of clarity. Yeah, I take your point that um, a very clear opposition kind of needs to emerge, um, but they are up against something uh, really unbelievably vast in the Russian military. And I wanted to kind of ask you a, a little bit about like the, the sheer scale of it that you, that you document and kind of historicize. Like you say that, you know, Russia's military expenditure between 2000 and 2020 exceeded a trillion dollars, which is, you know, uh, a lot of money, but you say a minor uh, portion of Russia's oil and gas profits. And so, you know, the, the point here though, is the, the kind of proportion, right? Like you say, uh, during those two decades, Russia's military budget increased by a factor of seven uh, compared to a factor of two in Germany uh, and 2.5 in the United States. Um, and that at the start of the invasion, Russia was spending about $1 billion a day on its war effort. Um, so, you know, the idea here, and I think this is somewhat like well known, is that that level of military expense is only possible if you are a petrostate with extraordinary oil and gas reserves. This is the kind of confluence that you're trying to uh, understand. And so when you say like year after year, fossil fuels make, make up more than two thirds of Russia's exports and funded more than half of its federal budget, you're trying to expose the fact that it is truly the case that, you know, Europe continuing to buy Russia's gas exports is, is fueling the war. Is that, do you see that as um, one of the, well understood aspects of this war that there is a direct connection between choosing to buy Russian energy and the invasion of Ukraine. And what do you think the implications of the of that kind of insight geopolitically are like long term? I think there is no secret about this, um, right? And like uh, the intelligence services, for sure, the. Uh, Mm, they they no, they used to know a lot about the Russian uh, oil course and dependence on its exports and all that. And uh, as we s see, we actually remember that uh, the European governments and the, the leadership of the European Union and also the leadership of the United States, the Biden's administration, they were working from the start on uh, reducing purchases of the, of the Russian oil and gas and creating a diff, all kind of different, uh, quite unprecedented regimes that would uh, uh, reduce Rus Ru Russian profits, like all this, you know, price caps and uh, mm -hmm. embargo plans. Uh, it's very difficult because uh, huge countries such as Germany, Italy, etc., they fully, fully, also fully depend on the on, on Russian energy, so it's you know long preparations and pain, painful decisions had to be done. But there is also a fact of uh, Asian uh, imports, China, India are powerful players here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the general public understand as much understand these um, mechanisms less than you know professionals than economists or 
or military or intelligence experts. This mm-hmm. is kind of all this oil trade, like climate change as well. Uh, of course, uh, common people, they are more interested in uh, you know, other aspects of the war, in uh, weapons, uh, it's true. and the armor. And this is something that you know, people could appreciate. And understand, and um, of course, the na- na- huge, also un- in- un- incredible numbers of victims on both sides. Right. Since uh, you know, since 1945, there was nothing like that happened in Europe, um, right. e- even close to that. Um, and of course, the, this kind of um, expenditures they also show on the, on the Russian part. They also show. These numbers that you cited, like one billion a day, they uh, n- nowadays Russia is able to spend uh, just a fraction of it. You know, it's like they, they, they are using like ten, ten, ten times less shells a day than they used to. It all shows very poor planning of the operation, or maybe full total absence of this planning. Mm-hmm. They, they believe that they would uh, win this war in a week or a couple of weeks and of course then this sort of uh, expenditures could be affordable but also you know this money money is huge the amounts of um, uh, weapons armor shells uh, you know gunpowder that they have wasted and all this by the way um, spoils our common atmosphere the, all these amounts are also huge, but uh, of course, anyone is also uh, soldiers, just you know, uh, humans, usually males, who operate all this equipment, and uh, you know, do, and they do it either skillfully or not. And Russia, with its huge demographic crisis, cannot, could not possibly afford this uh, kind of operation. There are just no soldiers. There are no, no young men. In Russia, that uh, Putin could um, send to to the war, he was uh, clearly afraid of doing this. So uh, he was uh, he was delaying and delaying this uh, mobilization until he could not just continue uh, the war without uh, new mobilized uh, troops, hundreds of thousands. The vast majority of soldiers uh, who um, fight and die there in, in, in this last Ukrainian front. They come from very distant corners of Russia. Right. Very few come from uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, even though it's like well, at least one-fifth of the Russian population live in these uh, two metropolitan areas. So vast majority come from um, uh, Siberia, from North Caucasus again. From um, distant corners, uh, uh, very poor er- areas, where um, of course their mothers would mourn, but no protest would be feasible in those little towns or villages. While of course, uh, if uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg or some uh, b- big cities of the Urals would receive th- that amount of uh, bad news, the protest would be inevitable. Mm-hmm. So there is this kind of asymmetrical sacrifice that mm-hmm. uh, is being done by, you know, this distant colonized areas of the Federation. It's all hugely asymmetrical. Yeah. And this pressure, that's uh, increasing differences, increase the sentry petal force like the, that would implode Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think like that asymmetrical sacrifice is um, maybe a characteristic of of almost all wars, but especially it would appear like modern wars. I mean, um, those who fight receive the least from the state. To kind of um, return to something you were saying earlier, like there is um, unfortunately not perhaps enough room to really like dwell with or time to dwell with like that profound insight you know that um one of the one of the many kind of criminal aspects of a war is that yeah there is this level of asymmetrical sacrifice and and dwelling with that complexity would be i don't know it would be it would it would mean more than fixating on 
the firepower or having more time and patience for the complexity rather than, you know, dwelling with like videos of demolition of a bridge or the spectacle of the sabotage of pipelines. We don't even know uh, the the nature of like who was responsible for the sabotage of those pipelines. Um, and so I think like this is maybe one of the reasons why we analytically, politically are, are stuck in this kind of circularity that seems to be a concept at the, at the center of your book, um, Nature's Evil. You know, like this, I, I wanted to ask you, I guess, about the title concept of that book. Um, the idea that there is this kind of vicious circle uh, to our contemporary era of sacrifice zones and asymmetrical sacrifice um, that, as you put it in the book, gradual changes alternate with explosive bursts and they are unpredictable. That, that is the nature of evil. Um, so the absence of a plan leads to massive sacrifice and we don't seem to have time or space to really um, you know, decode the nature of that particular kind of evil where the consequences are never anticipated. So, it, and in particular, when it comes to the the current writing you're doing on the climate crisis, you know, like it is the case that, uh, as you put it, you know, um, uh, war is a carbon disaster, right? That war, as you put it at a certain point in the new book, should not be allowed in a climate, climate crisis. And I like the bluntness of that statement. And so when I read in your book, you know, that air will be exhausted sooner than oil and water sooner than land, um, that the paradox is that the lack of air, which has no economic value, will leave oil, the very embodiment of this value, unsold and unburnt. Um, I think like that language of a kind of blunt, you know, engagement with the climate crisis and our, our current level of stuckness, this circularity that we currently experience um, is really useful. You, you acknowledge the fact that, you know, if it wasn't for oil, we wouldn't actually have the world as we know it. But you're also insisting that there needs to be a, a radical shift in people's like habits. Um, how did we, from your historical perspective, as it were, like uh, the research that you've done on the kind of indoctrination, how have we come to be so deeply reliant on oil as a kind of core part of our lifestyles? And how do you see ourselves, you know, see us as a kind of population, more, more or less, uh, divesting from those toxic habits. In, the, in that book, I really went do, deep into history and I look at uh, other natural resources that produce this kind of dependency of humans. And uh, so it's like a deep prehistory of the oil curse. Uh, say I start with um, uh, wood, firewood, tim timber, uh, forests, and um, imagine this huge city such in uh, ancient Rome. They had, um, you know, they, they, they needed some firewood for, say, heating, which is very clear to us, but that's the south. Much more they needed for, say, making bricks. You remember this huge uh, constructions of ancient Rome, it all made of bricks. They had no other source of energy than uh, firewood uh, or, or charcoal that is made of wood. So all this wood had to be brought to the place so they couldn't br bring, you know, bricks because bricks are much heavier. So they br brought wood, they cut forests all around and, th and then they went farther on and they cut and cut, cut and cut more forests. And then with some distance th that made the transportation impossible. So the, the, construct, the expansion of Rome, of this great city, stopped because of this dependence on uh, firewood. And then, you know, a similar story uh, repeated, uh, say, in um, uh, the Dutch Republic, uh, say, in, um, in Amsterdam and uh, the surrounding areas which all uh, were built on the marshes and uh, so there was no woods anymore uh, in uh, the Dutch Republic so, and they needed energy for everything that they did for bricks, for ceramics, for brewing beer, you know, you, you name it, for, for, for making cheese. So this energy, where, where to get it if you don't have firewood and they didn't have coal either. Mm -hmm. So it, it was taken f from uh, burning peat. So right. basically from under their feet, they, were, uh, they had this rich source of energy 
So they burned peat, huge amounts of peat, and therefore they decreased the level of the surface, the level of the earth on which they stood, their cities and uh, harbors and all that. Mm-hmm. And uh, they kind of, uh, so the, the, the famous uh, Dutch floods were uh, determined not, not so much by natural geography, but by this burning of peat in huge amounts. Right. So this uh, our contemporary story with oil and climate is not entirely new, mm-hmm. but it's always always about industry, about you know cities, about massive construction projects, uh, about imperial, and uh, yeah, here, 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 here we are with our mm-hmm. uh, you know, climate change and um, and um, oil uh, curves and uh, emissions. And uh, all these, you know, largely failed uh, projects of controlling emissions, all these em- emission trade schemes, they, 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 are, they are fine. But first, they uh, are not sufficient. And second, and most importantly, all this work only in the time of peace. Uh, the notion that these measures are insufficient and only possible under conditions for uh, of peace to me is really interesting um, to think about in light of the fact that you're also like trying to wrap your head around in your work, um, the, the role of the state in energy transition. Right. So, um, and I, I really wanted to ask you about this in terms of, you know, um, obviously Russia, but more broadly, like what, what states can legitimately do if we are colliding and we clearly are with the limits of the current energy regime of, of fossil fuels. I mean, you know, you talk about how, uh, um, you know, we, we cannot respond to these challenges without the state. And yet um, it is the case that, you know, as you say, in nature's evil, no government that depends on the popular vote will intervene really, really drastically in people's behavior. Like no government tomorrow is going to ban meat or say, you know, you, you are no longer allowed to have your gas fueled car like that's just you know you as you say we're talking about deeply unpopular measures and yet the state remains the only power that to quote you stands between the greed of the energy barons and the tragedy of drowned cities so that is um you know that's the kind of uh impasse that we're at where it is the case as you point out that like the state is really the only entity that we can imagine intervening in a meaningful way to stop the toxicity of the current environment, uh, industrial environment at its source. And yet it, it seems impossible, inconceivable for, um, for the state to move in, in, in an energy transition, a green direction. Right. Uh, and, and so I wondered if you could expand on that, but maybe specifically in relationship to your claim in the new book that, uh, Russia against modernity, that this war is a war between generations. Like you're talking about the fact that, you know, Putin is 70, Zelensky is 44. um, The age gap between the two governments is extraordinary. But then you're kind of zooming out and saying like, this is also a generational battle, literally for the survival of the planet. So in terms of like the role of the state, how do you see that intergenerational conflict resolving itself? You know, if we can't do away with the state, what, what kind of state do we need? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we definitely cannot do away with the with, uh, with the state. Uh, the states, uh, you know, the, during the COVID pandemic, we saw that actually the, the state, right, or the states were um, hugely important for you know both for lockdowns and for vaccination for That's for true. our you know salvation. Uh, that was all, the role of the state. So, uh, as we go to oil and gas, it's important to understand that the vast majority of uh, global oil and gas is traded by traded by the state-owned companies, mm-hmm. like uh, you know, Gazprom, Sinopec, and uh, and uh, and all that. You know, Chinese, uh, Saudi Arabian, and uh, you, you name them. Right. Uh, they, uh, you know, it's really there, there are numbers, but there, it's vast majority of total uh, energy. Uh, bil- uh, total reserves belong to the state. T- total trade, you know, uh, is done by the state agents. Uh, 
and uh, you know this money go back to the state in terms in in different forms like the ro- royalties, custom fees, taxation. Mm-hmm. And uh, in America, it's, it's different because there is a, a much higher uh, percent of uh, private ownership of um, oil fields, but not so much of pipelines, by the way. Also, on, on the global scale, most of these governments, most of these countries that trade oil, depend on oil trade, I call them petrostates, as, as you do as well, um, they are authoritarian states. They, they don't really depend on the popular vote. They kind of uh, feed their people. The peoples depend, vitally depend on their states because the source of prosperity belongs to the state, not to the people. Mm-hmm. In, in my book and also when I teach this situation, I see that the paradigmatic situation is a trade between two, two states of different types. Uh, resource dependent state versus labor dependent state mm-hmm. because ca- countries that make their revenue uh, of the labor and knowledge uh, of their citizens they have to buy that energy that fuel that uh, metals as well and the other resources from resource dependent states and and pay by the pr- products of labor of their people's while uh, those countries that rely on labor and they are mostly democratic countries, uh, they um, they have powerful green movements. We see it in Germany, and uh, and it's very uneven picture, of course, across democratic countries. But I, I I believe that there is some chance for this uh, for for green movements to convince the peoples in their country, in the democratic countries, in, mm-hmm. in the necessity of radical change, mm. which obviously de- also depend on the situation of peace. We see that the Green Party in um, Germany nowadays, they are, you know, they are <laughs> fully, and they're everywhere in Europe, the, the Greens, uh, in Baltic countries, Finland, the, the Greens are powerful, but they are fully focused on, on the war effort. So mm-hmm. they do, do, do not do green politics anymore. They are doing something else. Mm. Um, but also, um, the, so the, the other part of this uh, equation, the authoritarian petro states, they vitally depend on the continuation of business as usual, on tra- trading oil, trading gas, um, uh, enriching their elites, the usually corrupted elites, and also feeding their peoples and, uh, you know, uh, training their soldiers using this money. Uh, so the, the, uh, these governments, these countries, these peoples, they, they, they will n- never move into the direction of climate action. Right. Uh, voluntarily, you know, if they would be forced to do that somehow, they would resist. And uh, basically Russia is a paradigmatic case of, of this happening. You make that so clear. Um, that, you know, every, every effort will be made to maintain the status quo, to reinforce the idea that there is no alternative. Um, and that, you know, something like degrowth would be fatal. It's just unimaginable. Um, and there are two, it seems to me, uh, maybe, you know, you talk about a triple monopoly at a certain point, um, in your work. Um, I believe in Russia against modernity, you, you talk about this, triple monopoly, uh, whereby, you know, a petro state has a monopoly on violence, on the state use of force to suppress uh, any form of resistance or any threat to property. Um, They have a monopoly on energy. But then in the context of the current um, world order, there is also a higher level of global monopoly that's emerged where OPEC plus, where the plus stands for Russia, controls 55% of the global output, um, of, of oil. Right. And so, I mean, like that, uh, um, that particular structure, uh, overwhelming consolidation of power is hard to, um, you know, imagine re- resistance to like, it just is. Um, and, and so, I mean, number one, I guess I, I was really hoping that, uh, you would have time to just sort of 
drive home the point that you make that, in fact, we don't have a deep enough, deep enough understanding of what uh, of the role that monopoly kind of plays in, def- as you say, defining our civilization. I want to ask you that question in relationship to the kind of media monopoly that Putin's Russia is attempting to secure, where one after another, you know, even even vaguely critical source of alternative media is being shut down. Like, does that need to be factored into this this logic of triple monopoly, the the specific monopoly on information? And and in the West, do we give it maybe an outsized role, you know, in terms of fomenting the kinds of uh, dissent that might be meaningful? Yeah, it's also the, the, this fourth level of mo- mo- monopolization, monopoly on information on media. Mm-hmm. Usually it's called censorship, but it's much more than that. It's uh, censorship is like a negative control, but it, this is very pro proactive. They create this very kind of um, pro, very, very active um, uh, broadcasting companies and TV anchors and all that. Yeah, uh, that do that thing. Um, but uh, I, I think it st- has stopped working. Uh, hmm during the last, you know, years already. And this actually br- bring a, brings us back to that question about generation. It's, uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, it, it worked very well for the TV generation, uh, but it does not work anymore for the internet generation. And uh, these are generations, you know, unusually defined by the sort of type of of the medium, but the, that's, uh, you know, that's very important to see in the Russian context. Internet is um, pluralistic by design. You can you know, go, go from from one screen to another, you know, for, by one click. Uh, with and they they are all different. You know, you could know you if you know foreign languages, if you understand uh, the foreign media, that you you are uh, you basically you you have this kind of information freedom, whereas means uh, VPN etc. that could circumvent that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the young people who are using internet, whether they, you know, sp- speak foreign languages or understand them or not, that's a second issue. But they have this, you know, int- entirely different, uh, pluralistic, uh, panoramic, global view of the world. Uh, of course, that you know, some of them are still, uh, you know, imperialist, uh, nationalist, revanchists, but they, they minority. Say when Putin announced his partial mobilization. More people fled from this mobilization abroad than went to the front. Hmm. So, it, and, and that was all about you know young people in the you know in the, in the early, mostly about in the early twenties. Uh, it was like one hundred to two hundred thousand were mobilized, but about from different estimates from five hundred thousand to one million fled Russia to not very hospitable environments, places like Armenia or Kazakhstan, etc. Because they cannot, most, most of these people, they can come to Europe or, or Canada. They, right. they have no visas. So they have to survive. They have, you know, live their homes, um, families, parents, whatever. Yeah, I, know, I know a woman who, saving her son from military service, she, she had to leave her dog you know, in mm. some things, but things like that. It's huge, mm-hmm. huge suffering, essentially, and uh, total change of, uh, of of life. But people do that because they, uh, because, why? Because basically because they know truth. Mm-hmm. They, and they know that what they could see and hear from the TV is not true. Therefore, they stop having the TV sets. They stop turning them on. There is a mass kind of TV aversion among the Russian uh, younger uh, generation. And yeah. uh, this, I think, is the, um, you know, it's a, it's a modest uh, ground for hope because, you know, generations change. You know, we, we see that, you know, this old generation, basically, uh, septuagenarians like Putin, they, they, they uh, are very effective in holding power. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, do we have with the climate action and now with the war, 
and with future pandemics and all that, do we have time for waiting? Mm. You know, and uh, you know, this generation changes. You know, take decades. But but I think that's that's some 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 hope is grounded here. Yeah, no, I I agree, and I I see glimmers of hope in the way that you think about resistant uses of the internet, especially by people like um, Alexei Navalny or Vladimir Zelensky. You know, people who develop a, a specific kind of style of uh, communicating via you know a digital platform uh, that resonates potentially with people um, who are primed to reject. Uh, the misinformation, the propaganda, the lies, as you say, like of um, this regime, like Putin is clearly, you know, he feels deeply threatened by the internet. You say in 2014, he started calling the internet the CIA project. Um, so there's like this, again, this kind of panic, this fear around the internet um, that is is clearly founded in the, in the idea that you know, uh, uh, the savvy use of it for, op- for oppositional purposes can be potentially consequential you know and i guess yeah like so you know thanks so much for for talking to me um about all of these you know timely interventions that you're making uh i saw you know online there's a discussion that you did for the uh european institute for international law about the war where you say like there is accountability for putin in the kremlin uh that as you say like the disease of his insanity is not contagious that if he seems unhinged, he can be removed. Um, so just being able to imagine Russia without Putin, the world without autocratic leaders, is the kind of hope that I, I like to see leveraged. So I really appreciate both your time and, and all the time you put into your, your writing. Thank you so much for reading and listening to me uh, and promoting my work. I really appreciate it. And that was a pleasure to talking to you.